Would you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12? It's just been a wonderful, wonderful time of worship this morning already in Sunday school and through the, the music and the prayer time. It's Praise the Lord. Uh, number, hymn number 56, I'm just going to read you the first line in the chorus. It was on my mind last night and this morning. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. And then the chorus says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, give him glory, great things he hath done. And, you know, in, in uh, the letter that I, I sent out a couple or a week ago or so, I, I had an insert in there of uh, a little blurb that was put in the Village Missions um, brochure in July. And we sent, as Village Missionaries, we write our monthly reports, and then um, whoever puts these brochures together will just take different um, I guess highlights of each month and uh, put them in in a brochure and we made it in in July and it, it was just a rehearsing of what g- great things God has done to God be the glory great things he has done and what great things God is doing in Scotia how he is glorifying himself in Scotia how many of you had a chance to read through this little deal? Okay, then I, I don't think I need to repeat it. God has been doing some incredible things in our midst to glorify himself. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and pat you on the back. You no. Know? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They may see what you're doing or what God is doing through you and then they may give glory to God as a result. I think and pray that to an extent that has happened in our midst here in these past number of months. Also in that letter that you received, I shared with you what a tough summer it's been for so many of us. And the more that I talk to to different families about what kind of a summer it's been, it it's it's just been it's been odd in a way that I personally can't put my finger on. I've never had a summer like this. Not just all of even the physical things that have happened, but um, spiritual, emotional, mental. And then, you know, with the physical things, we were talking this morning about the drought uh, and the lack of rain and what a summer it's been there for so many of our families in in our church body here have experienced loss or frustration, or hardships, or sickness, and then a number of our families have lost loved ones. And um, <laughs> as you probably gathered in that, that letter that I wrote, I, uh, I got to a point, and it's, it's unbiblical, and yet it's biblical at the same time, where I sat back, and, and you don't say this out loud, but somewhere in the back of your mind, you think, God, do you hate me? Yeah. God, do you, do, you, do, you, do you hate me right now? David, David's psalms are littered with that. Psalm 61, David said, I feel like I'm at the end of the earth right now. Psalm 61, I feel like I am at the end of the earth. In Psalm 22, David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and then Jesus said he quoted that on the cross but David was the one who wrote it first he was going through that and he felt like God had forsaken him 
In Psalm 51, he had just had his affair with Bathsheba, and he's going through this guilt, and he says, restore unto me joy, because I don't have it right now. I don't have any joy in my life right now. Would you restore to me joy? I was reading through Job last night some, and uh, over and over, the book of Job, he's saying, God, why, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Why am I going through? Do you hate me? And over several times, Job says, I wish I would have never been born. It would have been better, I feel like, if I had never been born. Do you hate us, God? Have you forgotten us? It's, it's a question that humans, when we get in these time periods, maybe we don't ask, but we feel like it. And God responds by saying, no goofball, I don't hate you. And no goofball, I have not forgotten you. Hebrews 13, verse 5, I have made a promise that I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. In John 3, 16, God says, I love the world so much that I gave it the best that I had to give. I love you so much, it's a crazy love. I love you like crazy that I gave you the absolute best I had to give, which was my only begotten son. Do I hate you? No. I love you with a love you cannot fathom. No, I don't hate you, but there is one who does. I am not your enemy, but there is one who is. And that is Satan. And we see him show up here in a massive way in Revelation chapter 12. It, first, in Ephesians chapter 6, we, Satan gets one of his many titles as a ruler of darkness. Ruler of darkness. Now, again, you go back to Matthew where Jesus said, let your light so shine that people might see that and glorify God. So let your light shine in a dark place. Satan is the ruler of darkness and he doesn't like it at all when a church or an individual or a family says, you know what, this is what the Bible says and we're going to start doing this in our life biblically. We're going to start shining through, through the grace of God and through the working of the Holy Spirit. We're going to shine as a light. Chalk Hills made a step in that direction at the beginning of this year where we went back and we examined what church looked like in the beginning when it was having its biggest effect in the world and said, God, would you help us be that light? And so then when you, when you make a decision like that, the ruler of darkness hates it. And when you push toward heaven, he pushes back and he declares war against you. Here's what I just, when you say, Jesus, I want to follow you, and I, I want to know you, Satan declares war on you and nothing is sacred to Satan. He doesn't care if he affects your family. He doesn't care if he's able to affect the weather. And he is given a certain amount of latitude. He's on a leash, but he is given room to, to work. And he is given a certain amount of power. And you see that in Revelation. And he does not care about your health. He doesn't care about your spouse. He doesn't care about your family. He doesn't care about your parents. He doesn't care about your church. He doesn't care about your home. He doesn't care about your income. Nothing is sacred to Satan. And when you say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, Satan says, okay, then it is war. Here's the thing. If you want to have a pretty smooth life here, on earth for the most part just don't follow too closely to Jesus and Satan will he'll leave you alone <laughs> you want to ride say Jesus I want to follow you and the Bible promises an enemy he pushes back when an individual or a church 
pushes forward. Um, stay there in, uh, in Revelation. We're going to get there in a second. But I want to read you a couple of verses here. We mentioned David. He, he had those times where he felt like um, he was forsaken. In Acts chapter 13, if you just want to write down the reference, Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it says, um, And when he had removed him, God raised up for them David as king. God raised up David as king, to whom he, also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Acts 13, 22. David was a man after God's own heart who did all God's will. When you do all of God's will, and not just some, you don't read the Bible and pick and choose, well, I like this, and I don't really like this, and so I'll do this, but I'm going to try to not really think too much about that. And there's so many of us that do that. Again, we won't ever say that, but we do that. When you say, God, here's what it says, so here's what I'm going to do. You do all my will, then you get to experience what David experienced. And that is times where you feel like you're at the end of the earth. You have an enemy then. Um, Job, why did he go through the fire? Well, you read in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, God said, If you considered my servant Job, there is none who is upright and shuns evil like Job. Job said, I'm going to make a stand for God. I'm going to make a radical stand for God. There was no one like Job as upright and who shunned evil. And so Satan said, Can I have Adam? And God gave him a leash, but he said, Yep, you can have Adam. God, why do you hate me? I don't hate you. Satan does, though. There's so many more examples. Um, here's what I want us to see before we read Revelation 12. Church, the more you commit to following Jesus and to doing what is right and to doing exactly what God says as, as best you can through His grace... The more you commit to that, the more Satan will fight against you to discourage you, to detour you, and to destroy your faith along the way. Last week, we had a very simple message in Revelation 11, and that was, life belongs to God. That was the whole sum of the message last week. The sum of it this week is, you have an enemy. And we'll find out why that is so important to know that. That's, the, if, that's what I want you to remember, okay? If you leave away with one phrase, it is, I have an enemy. That's what we see in Revelation 12. This enemy shows up in Revelation 12. We'll read through it together. There is, um, there is probably more in this chapter that God has ministered to me than in any chapter in Revelation so far. And so we could go you know you could spend a long time here um and then we're not having bible study tonight so we're going to miss out on that which is it is what it is i encourage you though to maybe spend some time this week praying through revelation 12 the one thing i want to pick out this morning as we read through this is this book is a revelation of jesus well in chapter 12 it's a revelation of the enemy of jesus Okay, it's a revelation of Jesus' enemy and what we need to know about him. Chapter 12, verse 1, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. We won't spend time looking at why, but this seems to be a picture of Israel as the woman, the bride of Christ. And... Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. This child is, is Jesus, and we'll see that in a second. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon who is Satan, and we see that in verse 9, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child, capital C, as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, which is prophecy from the Psalms of Jesus. And her child was caught up to heaven and to his throne. And that speaks of the ascension of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. And then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. We talked about him in Sunday school. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God night and day or day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him, not by willpower, but by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Well, then the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Well, and then the dragon was enraged with the woman, but he can't get at her. And so he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Wild, crazy story. Um, we're not going to get deep at all. One thing I do want you to notice, though, is in verse 1 and in verse 3, they both start off by talking about a sign that appeared in heaven. John is the author of Revelation, the human author, and he does a pretty good job of telling us, okay, this is really happening, and this is a sign. Okay, this is a symbol. He does a pretty good job of letting us know what's, what is literally happening and what is meant to be a picture of something else and he says here twice there was a great sign so this really is chapter 12 is a story or like a, a parable of the story of Jesus the story of Jesus birth the story of Jesus ascension the story of Jesus's enemy the story of the people of Jesus and why the enemy of Jesus hates the people of Jesus so much that's the sign that you see in chapter 12. Um, what I want to look at this morning in uh, the next several minutes is the enemy of Jesus. Turn in your Bibles, would you, to Ezekiel chapter 28. Um, Close to the middle of your Bible, it's by Daniel and um, Jeremiah, in, be in between those books, Lamentations, and it's, it's a pretty big book. So you... But Ezekiel chapter 28, I 
We're going to begin uh, at verse 12. And what we see here is um, the king of Tyre, who is a symbolic character of Satan and who Satan was at one time. Um, you saw in, in Revelation 12, uh, verse 3, that Satan was a great dragon. He has seven heads and then seven crowns on his heads, which is symbolic of perfection. Look at the beginning here of Satan's story. And I don't know how many of us really think about it. He, he wasn't always the person that he is today. He didn't always have the role that he has today. Son of man, Ezekiel 28, 12, take up a lamentation or a weeping for the king of Tyre, who is symbolic of Satan, and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. Let that sink in. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. And then he lists all these stones. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones, and you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. And then verse 16 and on, we see that Satan was in the business of trading. He didn't like his situation. He wanted to be God. And so he traded the position he did have for an attempt to be God, and it didn't work out for him. Turn back, would you, uh, one, one more to Isaiah chapter 14. Beginning at verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. That was his name originally. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, or day star. That's what Lucifer means. Day star, bright star, son of the morning, glorious. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. But yet you shall be brought down to hell or to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. The story, the beginning of Satan, and this is important, okay? The beginning of Satan, Satan's story begins in heaven. He was created by God as the most glorious created being. God said, you were the seal of perfection. And Satan said, I want more. And God says in, in, uh, in Isaiah 42, I will not give my glory to another. And so God casts Satan out. And then we see, so you can turn back now to Revelation. In verse 4, it says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Well, Satan took a third of the angels with him. And before you understand why Satan hates you so much, it is important to understand all that Satan has lost. Satan lost his glory. He was the most glorious created being, and he lost it. And then God, it's in, again, that, like that song this morning, uh, your love is surprising. God took that glory that was once Satan and he chose a people for himself and then he put that glory on this people that he chose for himself. We read in Zephaniah chapter 3, God says, I rejoice over you, I dance around you, I sing over you. And that seems to be what he did with Lucifer 
at one time in history. You think of, I mean, the story is so much more tragic. It says, take up a weeping for him. It's a tragic, tragic story. Satan lost his glory, and God, in in a fathomless way, he put it on you. And now he dances over you, he sings over you, he rejoices over you. Satan lost his place. He lost his glory. In chapter 12, here in Revelation, verse 8, Satan is warring in heaven and did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. He lost his place. Who gets his place? John 14, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. You. Satan lost his place. We get his place. In, uh, in, Ch- in verse 12, we see that Satan is angry because he knows that his time is short, and so he's losing time. This is something, I, uh, especially in light of all we've gone through this summer, if this message doesn't really hit home to you, it is exactly what I needed to hear this week. You remind Satan of all that he's lost because you have replaced all that he has lost. And so he hates you with an everlasting hate. You remind him of everything he has lost and you have replaced everything that he has lost and so he hates you. In World War II, General Eisenhower is quoted with having said that if you hope to succeed against your enemy, you must, number one, know the enemy. You must, number two, know your equipment. And number three, keep the supply line open. And that would be prayer. Okay, it's just beautiful. Know your enemy, know your equipment, and keep the supply line open. What I want to do, and and we'll just do this, we'll do this fast, as we could spend forever if we really get in there, but I want us to see three different things that our enemy is. It says, know your enemy, okay, and what Revelation 12, just three things that we see in Revelation 12 of who our enemy is and how this is so important that we get this. Number one, it comes in verse nine. So the dragon, the great dragon, was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Number one, Satan is a deceiver and you need to know this, okay? Three things we see of our enemy. Number one, he is a deceiver. And he deceives us with all sorts of things. I'm going to name just a couple of his deceptive, his de- deceptions or his lies. One thing that Satan, again, there's probably hundreds. These are the ones that I have seen this past week as I've meditated on this. He is a deceiver. He tries to get you to believe that he isn't all that important or involved in your life. You don't need to think about him too much because he's not that important. Think about Jesus, but Satan really isn't important in the equation. You don't need to think about him. He's not really all that involved in your life. That is a deception. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, Man, be sober and be vigilant. Because your enemy, your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Peter says, church, don't be deceived. Satan is very much on the scene in our world today. And you need to be awake to that. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, dress up for war. You wouldn't need to dress up for war if you didn't have an enemy. But the fact is, you have an enemy, and so you need to be prepared for that. Satan would love to get you to think, He's not really involved in your life. He's not interested in your life. He is. You, you have, uh, 
We've had some meetings like that here, not very many, but you have church meetings, and it seems to really happen when, when two church families are somewhat at odds, and you get them together to resolve a conflict. Guess who makes sure he always has a front row ticket to those meetings? Satan. He would love you to believe that he's not that involved, but boy, it doesn't take long at all. You get two church families together, and you find that somebody who is very much in the room and very much interested in the outcome is, is Satan. Another deception is he tries to get you to believe that God's Word isn't always that accurate or necessary for every situation. This book, you know, this book is important, yes, but it isn't totally 100% right all the time, and you don't need it for every situation. We talked about it in Sunday school. Satan came, and the very first words that ever uttered his mouth that we have recorded here is, hath God said, did God really say? He gets us to question God's word. I had a phone call yesterday that I'd love to share the details and make it more relevant. I'm not going to, but I had opportunity of giving biblical advice to somebody recently on a situation they were going through. And I just told them what the Bible says. The thing about doing it biblically, whatever it is you're doing, is Jesus even said in, in John 15 and John 16, when you do it my way, heads up, there's, the enemy's going to be there. Well, I, I give this particular individual, not personal counsel, but just here's what the Bible said. Well, they followed it, praise the Lord. And... Satan got in the mix, and their situation turned worse than it was before I gave them biblical counsel. So I got a phone call yesterday from a gentleman involved with this other individual, and he, he gave me the what for. And, um, through this conversation... He mentioned that he was a Christian, and so, you know, he knows, he knows all about the, the Christian stuff, and so I said, uh, he said, you know, what you're doing is, was just, it was wrong, and it screwed the situation up, and I said, well, you know, as, as a fellow Christian, this is our book, and this is what we have to go by, and I said, all I did was share what God says. And the first thing he says, well, everybody knows that the Bible isn't accurate 100% of the time, and it differs from situation to situation. <laughs> I said, man, what else do you have? If this book isn't totally accurate, if, as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, this book is, is what there is for sound doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. If, if this book isn't totally accurate, what do you have? What do I have? Where are we at if we don't base it on this book? Everybody knows the Bible isn't 100% accurate all the time. I felt, you know, I feel sorry for you. When Paul tells you to gear up for battle against the enemy, the first thing he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, is gird your waist with truth, the belt of truth. And then the last thing he says is he talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So your entire armor outfit against fighting against the attacks of the enemy is knowing truth, and then the backside is having the Word of God. It just encompasses John 18, 37, Jesus says, I came in the world to bear witness to the truth. John 8, 32, Jesus said, the truth is what will set you free. Satan is a liar, and he is the father of lies. It is not good to lie, as we learned this morning in Sunday school. Satan is the liar and the father of lies. One last thing for this one. He's a deceiver, and one of the things I've found recently is he tries to whisper in your ear that fellowship 
isn't all that necessary. It's good. Yeah, it's good. It is fellowship is so good. But it isn't necessary. Oh, he's so good. He's been a deceiver from the beginning. Why? Because it works. You don't need fellowship. Hebrews 10, 25, Paul is begging you, do not forsake the fellowship or the assembling of yourselves together. It's important, but not necessary. Deceit. You've got to know your enemy. And then you know how to back it up. Again, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, all of these things have biblical background for them. I can share them with you later. And he shares that lie that you don't need fellowship because if he can separate you from the flock, here's that letter that I wrote last week, then he can be the second thing that you see in here, and that comes in verse 4, is he's waiting by this woman who was ready to give birth to Jesus to devour. He is a devourer. Um, let me just sum this one up with, I guess, one verse. John 10.10, 10, it says that he came to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, the beautiful thing about this is when you know Jesus as your personal Savior, here's another promise. Again, if I don't have this, man, what, what do I have? So I have this, and I read like in John chapter 10, verse 28, that Jesus said, I have I've chosen you, I have grabbed a hold of you, and nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Nobody. So I have a promise against Satan that I, I know that Satan can't take away my salvation. I can't take away my salvation. Nobody can. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Not even So my salvation isn't at stake, but then Satan can steal your joy. And David experienced that. He can steal your joy so that your experience with Jesus is a miserable one. If you don't realize he's there and that he's working at that. He can kill your testimony. I have sadly a growing list of names in the back of my Bible of men whose testimonies Satan has killed. Now, he hasn't taken their salvation, but he has killed their testimony. He can destroy your faith. You've got to be aware that he is out there doing that, seeking whom he may devour. And the third one, again, these go so much deeper than that, but we're just, I guess, making our, we're taking chapter 12 and just trying to make ourselves aware of Maybe one of the major situations surrounding Chalk Hills right now, okay? Satan is a deceiver. He is a devourer. And then this, this last one comes in verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God night and day has been cast down. The third and last one that I want us to see this morning is Satan is the accuser and he stands before God night and day accusing you to him. He stands before God saying, do you know what this person did today? Do you know what this person said do you know how this person reacted to this situation? Have you seen this person's attitude? Did you see what they were watching the other day? He does that night and day. He stands before God accusing you to God. And the beautiful thing, how do we respond to that? Well, we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and we claim his word, and over and over in his word, we see Jesus saying things like, did you know they did that today? And Jesus says, yeah, absolutely. But see, the thing is, Satan, I already died for that. And I already covered that mistake with my blood. And that is paid in full. And it is so much paid in full to the extent that I have chosen to remember it no more. Do you realize what this person thought or said or did or... Yep, but uh, again, Satan, like I just got done saying a second ago, it's already covered. I paid for it. Jesus stands in and says, I take this. I, take, I took the place. 
I took the place of them. You see that over and over. I'll give you a couple of verses to meditate on later. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Hebrews 7, 22. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And, and in that reference, it says, if anybody sins, they have an advocate in, in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.15, Jesus says that he came into the world to save what kind of people? Sinners. So Satan says, he's a sinner. And Jesus says, that's exactly who I came to save. And I accomplished it. They, they're, they're covered. So Satan accuses us night and day before God. And we need to be able to claim the promises in here that when Satan comes to us and starts accusing us before God, we can say, Satan, you know what? Just like Jesus said in Luke 4, it is written, it is written, it is written. My sin's been paid for. I'm not going to take your guilt because Jesus took that away. But then lastly, I think what Satan finds much more fun than accusing us before God because God doesn't bite that bait. So then Satan accuses us to one another. He comes to each of us and accuses me before you, accuses you before me. Accuses a mom to a son, accuses a husband to a wife. Because you know what? We bite on that. And we start thinking, you're right, they did do that to me. They did wrong me in that way. <laughs> my dad had a, we're almost done. My dad had a, he's, he's a big woodsman guy and loved to cut trees and uses saw and axe and wedges and things and, and uh, I don't know that you know we ever used the wood that he cut all that much he just enjoys doing that still does and uh, so he had this big old elm tree or this elm piece of wood out on our property and I still remember this um, he got this wedge and he was going to try to split this elm well, he got his wedge stuck in the elm couldn't get it out so he went to the, the store, and he bought another wedge. And he came back home, and he you know, was going to split the log plus get his other wedge out. Well, he got the second wedge stuck in this old elm. So then he went back to the store, and he asked the guy if he could buy wedges in bulk, you know, because it might be cheaper that way. Um, they bought himself another wedge. Came home and uh, got the first two, I, I can't quite remember how this works, but he got the first two unstuck, but then he had his third one stuck in there again, and the elm still hadn't split. So <laughs> my dad, uh, he, he chucked that piece of wood over next to our woods and just left it there and, and never touched it again. Um, he said he really, he would have loved to have tortured it if it could have felt pain, because it just made him so angry. But he left that piece of wood sitting by the woods. And Satan loves to do that with us, so he loved nothing more than to put a wedge between people, between families, between marriages, between churches. And the beautiful thing about the elm is it didn't let my dad do that. Put wedge after wedge after wedge in, but it wasn't budging. It, it, it wasn't going to budge. You know, I heard, a, I heard a guy the other day um, who uh, is kind of a, a cowboy sort of a character, and he got a chance to see one time, I think this is a true story, he made it seem like it was a true story, that uh, he was out and, and, again, this cowboy character back in the day, and he saw a, some wild beast, a wolf or something, a pack of wolves, coming against a team of wild horses. And he said, it was neat to see how these wild horses responded. They, they all got their heads together with their back feet sticking out, and they protected one another by kicking at the wolves when they would come in. We said it was a number of years later or whatever, and he got to see a very similar situation, only it was another wild beast coming against a pack of wild donkeys. And he said the donkeys, they all stuck their rear ends together, faced the enemy, and started kicking at one another, thinking they were, you know, defeating the enemy, but they were looking at the enemy with all their rear ends together, and they were kicking at each other. I just wonder how often, is that, how often does that happen in the church? The enemy comes and we respond by kicking at one another. I want to leave you with, uh, there's so much more. I want to leave you with a truth that has encouraged me greatly over the past maybe couple years. And that is this. When it comes to Satan accusing us to one another or accusing us before God... 
And I, write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. Our facts do not equal God's truth. Okay? Our facts do not equal God's truth. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you. The fact is, I am a wicked, miserable, gross sinner. Truth is, God sees me as pure and glorious and totally clean. I am forgiven. We have all sorts of facts that we could brew up against one another. Yeah, but pastor, this, and I've had this conversation, they did this though, and that's a fact. Well, that may be a fact, but let me tell you what the truth is. The truth is that fact doesn't matter. God already covered that. Jesus already paid for that. Ephesians chapter 4, let no rotten or corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is necessary for the edification or the building up of the body of Christ. We can use our words all the time to tear one another down, but the fact of the matter is, it, it isn't biblical truth. You may have all the facts in the world to support your angst against somebody, but if you look at truth, Jesus says the facts will set you free. No, he doesn't say that. Facts condemn us. The law condemns us. So Jesus said, you know, the facts are there, but I have overseeded them, superseded them with truth, and the truth will set you free. Jeremiah, you're a rotten sinner. You know what? You're right, Satan. But God's forgiven me. Jeremiah, so-and-so in, in, in your church is a rotten sinner. That is probably true, but they are also forgiven. And so I will choose to forgive them just as Christ forgave me. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing in Revelation 12 that we have an enemy. I thank you for that revelation because it opens up a new realm to us of why it is maybe not all the time, but often, that we experience the hurt and the frustration and the loss and the pain that we do experience because we have an enemy. I thank you for that clarification there and that truth there and that you love us desperately. I also thank you for the fact that we see in Revelation 12 that our enemy has ultimately lost. He has lost everything. And so, Father, though we will be the victors in the end, I pray with all my heart that you would do a work in Chalk Hills, in our individual lives and our families, that we would live as victors now. Live as being set free. Live as knowing the truth. Live as standing on the Word of God as the true and inerrant Word of God. We would live forgiving one another because it's easier. It, it, it's an easier way to live. It's a better way to live. Help us to experience. You said you came to give us life and life abundantly. May we know that we have an enemy who would take that life if he could. And may we cling to you and to your word with all our might so that we might experience the life abundant that you have promised for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.